Hello AQA and OCR students, some tough multiple choice questions coming your way in this video, really testing how well you know your knowledge of economic theory. But first, in your preparation for multiple choice questions, make sure you watch my conditions, formula and equations video for everything in micro and macro because multiple choice questions tend to focus a lot on that information. But also make sure you watch all the multiple choice questions videos I have on the channel. Uh, get all the information in from those so that we can smash these gifts from the economics gods when paper three comes your way. Let's dive in with a pretty tough Phillips curve question. We're working with a short run Phillips curve and a long run Phillips curve. We're told a government intervention has moved the economy from position A to position B. Always annotate and underline key parts of the question. It helps to keep the mind focused. So I told that, look, this movement from A to B, that's the first movement there, and that's because of government intervention. We're then told that the economy then moves from position B to position C. So from B to C is the second movement. The question is saying, which one of the following is most likely to explain the movement from point B to point C. So that's what we need to focus on. That's the movement we need to explain. But now to some background regarding the Phillips curve. Know that any movement along the SRPC curve will be because of an AD shift. We have a movement here. Whereas a shift of SRPC can only be because of a change in inflation expectations. Classical economists say that only happens when there is a shift of the SRAS curve. So shift of SRAS corresponds to a shift of SRPC. They say that when SRAS shifts, that's when you're more likely to get a change in inflation expectations. Whereas a shift of LRPC is equivalent to a shift of the LRAS curve. All right, so that is important background knowledge there. So the movement from A to B up the SRPC curve, that will be a shift of AD. If we're moving up the SRPC curve, AD will be shifting right. So the government intervention here might have been an increase in government spending or running a budget deficit, right? And we see the natural outcomes here of lower unemployment and higher demand pull inflation. But the question is saying, explain the movement from B to C. Well, B to C would be a shift of the SRPC curve, right? Getting us there. That will be the new SRPC curve to get the economy to a new equilibrium at point C. So what can cause that? Well, only a change in inflation expectations. And as we look at the answers now, there is only one um, answer here that links to a change in inflation expectations. It's B. Uh, so here it's an increase in inflation expectations, which will shift the SRPC curve to, a right, to the right, whereas a fall in inflation expectations would shift SRPC to the left. And if we look at the other answers, we can see why they're all wrong using the background. A is saying demand for exports has risen as a result of the intervention. Well, that will be a movement up the SRPC curve, right? AD shifting right. The government cuts taxes, AD shifting right. That's A to B, a movement up the SRPC curve. And the intervention has increased the natural rate of unemployment. That will be a shift left of LRAS and a shift right of LRPC, not what we're looking for B to C. So there we go. The importance of annotating and focusing our mind, but also knowledge of the Phillips curve. So there you have it. The importance of underlining and annotating. Let's do exactly the same now for a balance of payments question. A technical question about the balance of payments. I know the balance of payments causes nightmares for many students out there. Let's make sure we're OK with it. So this question is saying which one of the following would be classified as a debit item? Immediately jargon is there. So with the balance of payments, debit is whenever money leaves a country going abroad, whereas a credit is whenever money enters a country from abroad. So credits are inflows, debits are outflows. I would write that in at the top to avoid confusion, to make sure we know exactly what we're looking for. So we're looking for a debit item in the secondary income part of the UK's balance of payments, the current account of the UK's balance of payments, right. So we're looking for a money outflow in the secondary income part of the current account for the UK. Let's go straight to some background because to know this question, we need to be able to dissect the balance of payments and know what goes in to various accounts within it. So take the current account. Within that, we're looking at credits and debits. So money inflows, money outflows from trading goods, trading services, but also primary secondary income, but know specifically that primary income is investment income. So any income from financial investments overseas. So for example, UK people might be holding financial investments overseas, returns from those investments brought back to the UK would be a credit. Whereas foreigners who are holding uh, UK financial assets in the UK, any returns from those sent back to their home country would be a debit of investment income for the UK. 
But secondary income is current transfers. Learn this in three ways. So this could be worker income transfers, remittances. It could be business profit transfers, the repatriation of profit. It could be government transfers. So for example, government paying fees or government's paying aid. Both of those will be debits uh, or maybe government's receiving aid. That would be a credit. So that's the current account. Whereas the financial account, it's got three balances. Portfolio investment, that's the buying and selling of financial assets. So buying and selling is portfolio investment. Returns on those assets is investment income in the current account. Uh, direct investment is the value of investment as firms enter or leave a country. And then reserve assets, just reserves of gold and foreign currency. So understanding that, we can now look at the options here and work out what is a debit item, a money outflow in the secondary income, so current transfers part of the UK's current account. Well, A is saying dividends are paid to overseas owners of shares in UK companies. Okay. So these are overseas owners who are receiving dividends. So this is going to be a debit for the UK, correct? But it's primary income, not secondary income. So A is wrong for that reason. B, emergency aid paid to another country following a natural disaster. So the UK government is paying emergency aid. That's a debit. Yeah, money is leaving the UK. It's going to another country. And yes, this is secondary income. This is a transfer. We just said that aid money would be a current transfer, secondary income. So this is going to be the correct answer, but confirm by looking at C and D. So C, investment in a building, uh, investment in building a factory abroad by a UK firm. So again, this is a debit, this is money leaving the UK, but in building a factory abroad. So this is gonna be direct investment in the financial account, not secondary income in the current account. And then premiums paid by UK-based organizations to foreign insurance companies. So again, money is leaving the UK, it's a debit, but to foreign insurance companies, insurance is a service. So this is a debit in the trade and services part of the current account, not secondary income. So everything works. The answer is B. So there you go. Once you know the structure of the balance of payments, those questions are quite easy. Let's move now to the circular flow of income, a tricky question coming up. So we're told that this is the circular flow of income. And for this economy, there is macroeconomic equilibrium. So important information there. We go straight to the background. Remember, what macro equilibrium is with the circular flow. It's when injections are equal to leakages, injections, investment, government spending, exports, leakages, savings, imports, taxation. Whereas a growing economy, injections are greater than leakages, a shrinking economy, injections are less than leakages. So looking at this model here, if we add up the injections, we get to a thousand billion dollars, essentially a trillion dollars, but keep it to a thousand to keep our life easy here. So what we need is the other side to also equal a thousand for this economy to be in equilibrium. But we're given more information below in the economy. Net exports are negative 50 billion. So net exports, exports minus imports. We're given exports of $300 billion here. So for net exports to be minus 50, imports must be $350 billion. Then we just need to work out what combination is going to be correct down below for this economy to be in macro equilibrium. Well, we know imports are 350 billion, so that immediately eradicates B and D as options. Then it's just finding the option which sums to a thousand, and that is A. But you see how important the background is here. So there you have it, all nice and easy, nothing difficult now. Let's finish with a toughie on exchange rates. Now to a funky little exchange rates question here where logic is very important. So here we have a table that shows the value of the pound in euros and Canadian dollars. Again, underline and annotate key bits, write down anything that's going to help you. Um, so we have, yes, a table that shows the value of the pound in euros and in Canadian dollars. But what we need to do, the question is down here, is say that what's happened to the value of the Canadian dollar between 2021 and 2022, the value of the Canadian dollar, right? So let's dissect and understand what the information in the table is telling us. So the value of pounds in euros, well, was one euro 11, now one euro 19. So one pound can buy more euros. That's very clearly a stronger pound against the euro. Uh, whereas pound to Canadian dollars, well, one pound could buy one dollar uh, 76, whereas in 2022, it's buying less. So this is now a weaker pound a weaker pound to the Canadian dollar, but that implies a stronger Canadian dollar to the pound. 
we can imply that, right? A weaker pound to the dollar means a stronger dollar to the pound. So that immediately eradicates C and D, which says the dollar is weakened against the pound. It hasn't. The pound is weakened against the dollar, which means the dollar is stronger against the pound. So C and D are clearly wrong. But now through inference, right, we can work out the rest. We know the dollar is stronger against the pound. We just said the pound is stronger against the euro. Yeah, well, if the dollar is stronger against the pound, by definition, the dollar must also be stronger against the euro if the pound is stronger against the euro. So that takes you to A. You work that out through logic and inference. A tricky question nailed on here. But you see, again, writing things down, annotating. So helpful to break down these tricky questions. So now you see some tough questions really testing your knowledge of economic theory. Well done for getting through this video. But as I said at the start, make sure you've watched my formula conditions and equations videos for micro and macro, as well as all the other multiple choice questions videos on the channel. We want to be smashing these questions when they come up in paper three. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Can't wait to see you in the next one where we do this again.